Welcome to this special edition of the Minor Consult. Earlier this year, I had the privilege to sit down with Renee Wegerson, inaugural director of the new Federal Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, in front of a live audience at Stanford. We discussed her vision and roadmap for the agency, insights from her career in biosecurity, and advice for budding leaders in biomedicine. So without further ado, let's get into our episode. Renee, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And congratulations. It's really exciting. A new institute, a new agency from scratch uh, with a bold vision. And can you talk about, um, you know, you were approached about the position and you must have thought about it. And um, when you decided to accept it, what was going through your mind? And in these initial months, how's the vision coming together? Great. Well, thank you very much for, for having me here today, my colleagues from ARPA-H. And uh, I just, just how refreshing it is to, for you to encourage your faculty to come <laughs> and, and serve, uh, serve the federal government and, and the nation because it's not, not every, every institute is that, that excited, but you're right, the, everybody wins and, uh, and, and we can all advance the state of the art because it really is a different business model. So a little bit about my background, I, I spent uh, five years five years as a program manager at, uh, at DARPA, where I was able to launch programs. And so, so what's really important about the, the, the ARPA type business model is that you have program managers who actually help shape the technical vision of the organization, and they come in with a, a problem that they want to solve. And so it's very problem focused, and so those problems and the program managers just cycle through. So they come in for about three years at ARPA-H is gonna be the base, uh, the base uh, mandate, and then uh, bring on uh, up to another three years and start a number of programs to solve big problems. And so I got to do that at DARPA, and it was so exciting to do that on the defense uh, side of biotechnology, but uh, numerous times I had to say no to projects that uh, just didn't, didn't align with the big D in front of DARPA defense. You know, pediatric cancer, I remember vividly having a project come in, and we just, we just had to say no, it wasn't, it wasn't within the mandate. So I knew that the energy was there um, in the community for an ARPA for health, and I certainly wasn't the only one that recognized that energy because, of course, um, the president and, and many folks for years had tried to sort of build uh, the runway to allow to launch an organization uh, like, ARP, like ARPA-H. And so when my term was up at DARPA, I left, I went to the private sector um, and worked in industry and really through that experience during the pandemic saw how there are so, there's better ways that we can do public-private partnerships. And so it was really that experience in industry that we can do things better with government and then having lived the DARPA experience when um, the White House first called me, it was um, over a year ago, but they were like, we'd like to hear, uh, what are your opinions about what, what an ARPA for Health should look like? Um, and then I had a lot of opinions, <laughs> uh, <laughs> some things that were really just uncompromising about. So some of the things that we have to be uncompromising about if you want an ARPA for Health to be successful is the program manager has to be the decision maker. Um, no, no study sections or decisions by committee because we need to be able to take big risks. It's on the program manager to mitigate those risks, but they have to be able to take those big risks. We have to be able to recruit uh, from everywhere, from industry, from academia, um, and that means that we have to offer salaries that are not, um, uh, you know, typical government scale salaries that we can be competitive with industry and that we have to um, be able to hire people where they're at. It's, it's a lot to ask somebody to move uh, for three years, especially if they have families, et cetera, so, so don't require them to move. They have to travel a lot, but you know, these are some of the uncompromising things. And then direct hiring authority. That means if there's an urgent problem, we have to hire them like next week to try to start solving this, this problem. Um, so it has to be just different from the rest of the health ecosystem. So there is already a $1.7 trillion in HHS. And so if you're gonna start an ARPA for Health, it can't replace anybody. It has to actually augment and be an accelerator for innovation that can then move into and, and translate into commercial sector or, or to NIH. And so these are the uncompromising uh, drum beats that I kept sharing with the White House. So I, I have to admit I was a little bit surprised when I got a call from the president <laughs> uh, inviting me to uh, to take that vision of what an ARPA should look like to launch it and help create that culture. And so as you, as you mentioned um, on October 11th, I was sworn in to, to do just that. 
So it's really a startup within government. So uh, I know, you know we're in Silicon Valley here, and so uh, is it startup is, is a familiar term out here, but really think we launched our website last week. <laughs> this is, we, are, we are a new government agency, and so all the things we've been spending a lot of time, you ask, you know, what am I focusing on now? Um, it's building the team inside of ARPA-H that could help like do the contracting. We need our legal team. We need our human resources team. So everything you need to run a business smoothly, we're, we, we're hiring that. We're almost done. We have a lot of our leaders in place now um, and so the focus is really on the program managers now um, I hope to at a minimum hire 10 this year up, up to 20 uh, to spend the two and a half billion dollars the president has given me to uh, to solve those big problems in health and so each of those 10 to 20 program managers should bring a unique problem that they want to solve we're not mandated to solve any one disease problem uh, we, we, we can we can you know uh, Whatever the problem is in health that we want to pursue, we're going to you know, select a diversity of those challenges. And so um, it's really that hiring. I can't spend the $2.5 billion until I have the program manager champions in place that are excited uh, about that, that work to move forward. You, you mentioned a number of things <clears throat> that you've brought over from DARPA. In other words, uh, procedural elements and organizational features that enabled, has enabled, have enabled DARPA to be so impactful. Uh, nimbleness, for example, being able to hire quickly, being able to leave people in, in situ as they do their work as program managers. As you start to put together the themes, uh, without putting you on the spot to identify those themes, because I would imagine they're still being formed, but what's, what are the top features of the themes that you'll select as, as you're interviewing program managers? Because mm -hmm. given that, as you described it, the program manager will have the authority and the expectation uh, to make decisions on projects and track those projects, um, a lot of what's funded will be dependent upon the interests and background of the program manager. So are there right. some overall mm -hmm. themes that you're working with now that you can share with us? Uh, absolutely. So um, one of the first things we did in the in the first few months at ARPA-H was, was make our mission statement. And so what is that mission statement that is going to be relevant for any problem that we try to solve and that will withstand the test of time, that will be relevant 20 years from now? And so we landed on um, accelerate better health outcomes for everyone. And so implicit in that mission statement is um, health outcomes. So it's not just curing diseases, it's, it's whatever the ailment may be, or even if it's just extending a health span of, of somebody, what is that outcome that is measurable that we're going to be able to pursue? And then for everyone, it was a really important uh, piece for us. And so uh, the way that we're making that more tangible is uh, in the framing of the problems and programs that we'll solve. So the, one of the things we adopted from DARPA was something called um, the Heilmeyer questions. And so George Heilmeyer, um, a, a director of DARPA had put together a set of eight questions. Uh, I think Venture uses it too, where it's what is the problem you're trying to solve? How is it done today? Um, what's new in your approach? So why, why do you think there's something different? What's the shift in technology that you think is going to really enable that you to solve this problem? What are the risks? Who's it going to impact? Um, how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? And what are the milestones? So we've adopted all of those. There are great ways to define a problem, but we've added two more questions for ARPA-H in particular. Um, the ninth Heilmeyer that we've added is um, how much, how are you going to address cost right at the beginning? Build that into the design of your project. Make sure you're thinking about um, who needs to use this project, set a price cap if you need to, and how are you going to make it accessible? And what is the user experience? And so this is all our customer is the American public. And so uh, unlike DARPA, Warfighters, the customer, how do we really get this to every setting? And so building in that you know, uh, human-centered design user experience is a key part of this. Um, so it's a long question, a lot of, of pieces to that. Uh, and then the next question that we added is just, how might this be misinterpreted or misunderstood? And so making sure that we're, we're thinking about how are we sharing our, our, our programs? Um, and that's a lot, that's where a lot of lessons learned, you know, using the term biosurveillance for a diagnostics program, I, I'm a scientist, I, I know what that means, but for somebody who's not a scientist, that word surveillance can be really threatening. And so, so how, do you, how do you think about how you're communicating the world, what you're trying to do in a, in a way that is, is not gonna be mismessaged? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just finish. We, we actually have defined four mission thrust areas that we're really excited about pursuing. We think that these are, um, I would call them big levers in health, that if we can put a lot of investment in that, that we think it's gonna move forward the state of the art. And these are meant to be very high level that we can just inspire in, in future program managers. What are the types of areas we wanna make an impact? 
So one area is called health science futures. This is um, where we, you know, when someone says, what disease is ARPA-H focused on? I say, actually, it's, it's this health science futures. What are the tools and platforms and technologies that are actually going to advance a number of diseases? And so you can imagine a program manager has the next molecular therapeutic platform. They may fund five teams. Each of those teams, maybe one team is focused on Alzheimer's, one is focused on cancer. We want to really just advance the tools. The second is scalable solutions. So there have been a lot of really exciting innovations that I'm sure many of them come from Stanford as well. Uh, but, but how do we actually get beyond prototype stage to scale? How do we scale not only in terms of it's a therapeutic, how do you, you know, scale the millions of doses of something, or how do you scale to reach people in their homes and where they're at? So thinking about scale in those dimensions. Proactive Health is another uh, office that, that, we're, that we're standing up. And this is, uh, how do you keep people from becoming patients in the first place? And so what are not only the, the di diagnostic and detection uh, tools that we need, but what about um, social and behavior programs that we can have, um, that we can fund at ARPA-H2 to uh, prevent diseases that we know are preventable through, right. through behaviors? Those three offices are really, if you're, if you're somebody who likes to think about uh, you know, innovation, like P-type product innovation, those are those offices. S-type innovation or systems innovation is our last resilient systems office, which is really focused on, okay, we've just proved the last three years we don't have a resilient healthcare system. <laughs> and so, so what, what are the tools that we need to build in now um, that will make us resilient for whatever the next threat is, if it's a pandemic or if it's an economic threat or a climate threat? Um, and so this is, uh, we think a lot of systems integration is going to come into this office too, bringing together maybe pockets of innovation that haven't yet been layered into a digital layer to share data, uh, et cetera. So some of the digital health solutions we think will come in those areas. So very broad, but just meant to inspire um, kind of those out, leaning towards the outcomes that we hope to get um, for the first cohorts of program managers. Thank you. What, one other question, then we'll open it up for the yeah, audience. Sure. But um, for everyone, those are two very important words yeah. as you just emphasized. And, um, and we, there is a lot of innovation going on in biotech life sciences. Of course, health equity involves equity to access and to, um, and to the latest treatments for all. Uh, but also, health equity increasingly should involve earlier stream work as well. That is, discovery-based research and early translation on the conditions and determinants that you were talking about, social determinants of health, that have been neglected perhaps because they're hard, uh, also perhaps because People just haven't thought about them. I, for example, I don't really understand why it took so long to get a GLP you know, agonist, uh, a glucagon-like glucagon peptide agonist that, of course, now fortunately we do have one and showing a lot of encouraging results in treating mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes and maybe obesity as well. But, you know, in the midst of all the other biotech advances, why was this one so lagging? I mean, it's a fairly straightforward right. concept. We haven't had a new, a fundamentally new antihypertensive introduced for, what, two decades? Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, there are lots of determinants of hypertension, but as you tackle these gnarly problems that we have to tackle yeah. to get to for all, what are the themes at this stage that you're, you're most focused on that you feel like you can have impact through, uh, through the programs and approaches you'll be shepherding at ARPA-H? Yeah, I think your example is a really great one because perhaps some of the, the you know, lag in bringing those things to the marketplace is that the marketplace wasn't interested yeah. in, in the pool to, to bring it forward. And so what, what we're very lucky at ARPA H is that there's, uh, we don't have to have that market pool to begin with. And so um, we, we will tackle these hard problems that nobody else will to show that something works and is possible. Um, unique to ARPA-H, uh, something that doesn't exist at DARPA, is we're starting an entire office that is meant to serve the program managers and programs on transition uh, of those projects out of ARPA-H, and, and including that you know, early design uh, of those projects, but helping program managers understand the market assessment before they, they even begin a project. And if the market doesn't exist, then that's part of their job. Is <laughs> so if they're going to pursue this early stage discovery technology, start to get the marketplace excited about this and, and build a path forward and, and maybe find somebody who could be that pool on the back end. And so, again, you know, we're an organization of, of experiments, not only the programs themselves, but how we approach the problem. And that is, that is one that we want to take really seriously. I'll also say you know, there's a lot of power in being a funder. 
Um, even in my own programs at DARPA, you have you know rather large bank accounts, programs between 50, 150 million dollars. You can mandate in your in your broad agency announcement. Uh, proposals must include, uh, you know, engagement with communities or your clinical trial has to be, represent the diversity of the patient population that is, you know, that has this disease more presently, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, need not apply if you don't, if you don't m meet those criteria and you don't have to give the funds to that group. And so that program manager having that passion to solve that problem in a way that's going to benefit the most people is, is one of our most, it's really our superpower at, at our page. Great, great. Well, thank you. So we'll turn to questions now. We'll take questions from within the room and also for those of you on the live stream, I believe there's a mechanism for you to uh, submit questions. I'd also like to again mention to those of you who may have recently joined the live stream uh, that Dr. Wegerson is actively looking for program managers. And I mentioned at the outset that uh, for all Stanford faculty, we do uh, not only allow but encourage our faculty who wish to pursue government service uh, whether it's a uh, program manager at ARPA-H or other forms of government service, that we try to work with you to make sure you're able to do that. Of course, we allow people to take a leave of absence, and we do everything we can to facilitate a smooth transition into government and then back to Stanford after your governmental service is finished. So if you have questions, if we can help in the dean's office with that, just reach out to us. Let's open it up now for questions, and ah, I see a lot of questions, which is wonderful. I think uh, Dr. Crystal Makel is, uh, has a question. Yeah, Crystal, good afternoon, go and it was great to speak to you earlier, and thank you for being here. We're so excited about ARPA-H. Um, I guess I have two, a, a two-part question. What does success look like? In other words, of your 10 or 20 programs that you start, is the goal ultimately to end up having the private sector take them over? Or are some of these programs going to result in, uh, you know, nonprofit or long-term government commitments? And to the private sector question, how do you, how do you deal with the concern that, you know, you'll be doing what biotech was going to do anyway with government funds? So I'm just interested in that interaction between mm -hmm. private sector and ARPA-H in a perfect world. Right, so um, success for us uh, really looks like uh, we would use the kind of jargon internally as survive in the wild. So we want something should be a transaction at ARPA-H will show that something's possible and then it should leave the organization. And so whether that is we help an academic group uh, spin out a company, uh, we've been meeting with investors trying to understand like how, help us understand what your pool is going to be. Maybe you can help us uh, establish management teams in these, these first you know, companies that will form and, and bring that forward. What's great is uh, our page doesn't take any equity, so uh, you know, we, we hope the investment community understands how we can, we can help accelerate. So even, even if there are some things that the biotech sector wants to develop over time, again, our mission is to accelerate that. So uh, what we're, I've you know, spoken with members of Congress, what everybody agrees on, no matter what the party is, is it takes too long to have health solutions. Everybody wants a faster response. And so if we can do our job and accelerate that, that's gonna be really, really important. Um, the, you know, the, the scale of technology readiness is usually a scale of you know, one to nine. nine. One being very basic in the lab, nine is like off the shelf, right? And so, so we, we aren't mandated to focus on any one particular piece of that technology readiness, but I, I, you know, this very low risk when it's you know, TRL five and above. So, so I think we're gonna be mostly focused on TRL one through five and, and we'll encourage our program managers to, to look at those places. But for the systems integration, I can see us working at the higher higher end of, of, of the spectrum. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I, I just want to come back to that user-centered design. We want to create tools and products that people want to use and that it, we want it to be so obvious to the rest of, of the healthcare funders and the rest of the world, like why ARPA-H is here and that there's a different way that we can design and, and move that forward. So that'll look like success. The last thing, and this thing maybe sound a little funny, but like success is also should look like failure. So if we're not taking big enough risks, this will be familiar to this community, um, we, have to, we have to give ourselves space to fail sometimes, fail fast, dust ourselves off, recover from it, but um, I would expect in the first few years of ARPA-H we'll see some failure too. Great, so I think we'll alternate between questions from the room and questions submitted uh, through the live stream. So through the live stream, there's a question, what's the agency's vision and plans for research to reduce health disparities? So, so I touched on this a little bit already through having you know, Heilmeier 9, that we, the program managers have to address this right up front, that it needs to be included. But um, 
you know, we would love to hear ideas from the community of what works and what doesn't work. We did launch ARPA-H at Howard University, right, right in DC, to really, you know, emphasize we want program managers from the communities that can benefit most. We want to performers from these communities. And so what are the real practical ways in which we're going to do that? I think we're still figuring it out. But it is, uh, it is a, you know, the performance of our program managers is going to depend on their ability to, to, to answer that goal. They'll be measured right. on it. Right. Question from the room. Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is Akash Shah. I'm a freshman undergrad here at Stanford. And I'm also a student of Dean Miners. And my question is that... Um, what is what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what There's no the, extra credit in the course. <laughs> go ahead. What's the timeline that we have with the X amount of money that we've been given? What do you think? Approximately how many years from now um, will we start seeing substantial results that we might be able to, you know, put into the community, the global mm -hmm. community? Yeah. So uh, you know, the typical timeline for an ARPA is is five, ten years. Um, although I, I feel such energy from the community that there's a, a, a few low-hanging fruit, and especially around digital health solutions, that I, I think we can have impact pretty quickly. Um, there's no mandate. For, I, I'm not mandated to have a solution by X date. Uh, I do have expiration dates on my money. So uh, I, I have two and a half billion right now to start, but it's called what's in the government is three year money. So I have three years to spend that. And so, uh, but if I'm doing my job, I'm spending it faster than that because I want to ask for more money. <laughs> um, and so, so that's going to be the pressure. And in, in my role in this organization is just to start to show, even if we don't have a win that it's in somebody's hands, that it's obvious that our approach is different and that there's a pathway and milestone. So it might be in the person's hands five years from now. And then this is what we've done in the last six months to, to make that a reality and showing that all the pieces are there, that we're not just funding an academic group, we're funding a team that includes a transition partner that can help you know, bring it across the finish line. So those will be some of our early wins that, that I hope uh, to create. Thank you. A question from the live stream, how will ARPA-H interact with NIH leadership and vision? Yeah, so this is, um, for those of you that aren't aficionados tracking the, 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 uh, the omnibus legislation, <laughs> um, the, the way that uh, the, the omnibus legislation kind of locked in the authorities of ARPA-H, and so the structure is I report directly to Secretary Javier Becerra, the Secretary of Health, so he's my boss, um, and I, but our institute is, it's, it's, uh, it's actually it's an agency within NIH. So you know, the National Institutes of Health, there's 27 institutes. I'm a separate agency within that structure. What that allows us to do is from day one, I didn't have to have somebody like do payroll. I could just use NIH to help us do payroll and really have that infrastructure. Um, but of course, there's incredible subject matter expertise at NIH that we want to leverage. Um, and so what we've been doing, I've, I've met with about 12 of the institute directors and teams now to really understand what are their big problems that they can't fund given how their structures are um, that we might be interested in so I can proactively look for program managers in those areas and identify ways that we can collaborate. Um, every program manager, when they, when they fund a program, should also be talking to stakeholders in the community, including NIH, to help inform um, you know, what makes the best program. NIH won't make the decisions for us, but we can learn from them. And so even when I was at DARPA, I had NIH um, program officers um, informing me and providing perspective on those, on those different um, cases. But our, our budget even is completely separate from, from NIH. Right. Yes, let's see. We have a question from the room. Uh, Oh, sorry, we have a mic right there. We'll We've got to get next. you next because you're, you're, you're raising. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've been trying. <laughs> sorry, yes. Go, go ahead. We'll, we'll bring you the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for um, bringing all this up and the great interview. I have a question um, for in your ag agency. Beside the um, uh, managers, is there any opportunity, uh, initiative at Stanford and other academia who have wonderful thought and suggestion have to go after this um, um, health issues, reach out to you guys and your agencies and ask for funding. We can definitely help you to <laughs> spend some of those yeah. funds. Yeah, so uh, you know, everybody wants to know, when, when can we be a, a grantee or performer on, on these programs? And so a little bit of time, and once we get program managers on board, um, we, we, we're going to have our first program managers starting this quarter. It'll be rolling. We'll be adding them on and on you know, consistently. Um, but it takes about three or four months once a program manager has arrived at the agency to, to sort of refine their, their big problem in health and then write that into a solicitation. And then that solicitation, that call for proposals comes out. And so by the end of the spring, early summer, you should start to see some of those announcements. 
But what's really important to understand is if you're really excited about an area, you can help me by finding the program manager champion that cares about that area that wants to come to the federal government because I can't fund your project until I have a champion that's excited about it. So it's a little bit, so you know, look to your network, who are the one or two people that you think would be willing to jump um, and take a program manager initiative to, to pursue this area. The other thing I should say is we'll, we'll, um, once we have program managers on board and the technical team to evaluate proposals, we'll have more of an open call where you know, we don't want to have uh, you know, no, no good idea left uh, you know, unconsidered. And so uh, th this will be a way to just let us know, here's what I'm thinking about, here's a one or two page uh, white paper concept. If you're interested, then we can reach out to, to learn more. We don't have that yet. Again, we need the technical staff to do the reviews, but that should also be coming in that time, time frame as well. A question for the live stream. What's ARPA-H's vision for bringing more scientific research into the clinic? So uh, in terms of bringing more to the clinic, what we would love to do, um, one of the experiences that I had as a DARPA program manager, so I, I again, I told you, our, our customer is a warfighter. I've never served um, in the military, but I had to solve problems for military personnel. And so um, what DARPA provided for me are opportunities to embed. Um, with uh, you know, with SEAL units, with with uh, at Marines at Quantico, and just experience like a day in the life, right? Um, I even got to fly in an F-16. That was pretty cool. Um, and so, so that that brings you a different perspective. You know, pilots are suffering for like radiation uh, exposure that leads to unusual cancers, right? And so, like understanding that and and really experiencing is, is such a core part of how I can solve that problem in a better way and bring the teams together. And so, we want to create that for our program managers and to ha give them those immersive experiences where they can. Um, work with clinicians, et cetera, but then also find uh, you know, partners in the clinic who'll be willing to, uh, to bring whatever their concept is into their work streams and provide that feedback along the way so that we have something that's more likely to transition um, on the back end. It's just one example, um, but you know, certainly open to those program managers to come in and create, create new paths to do that. Thank you, thank you. Another question from the live stream. How does ARPA-H plan to ensure diversity of ideas and backgrounds as suggested in the call for program officials? Are the review metrics transparently posted somewhere? Yeah, so um, we are, there's four areas of diversity that we're trying to look across our, our program managers. And so it's geographic diversity. Um, we want people from all, all parts of the country and even world. Um, we're interested in demographic diversity, uh, diversity of experience. So, uh, you know, whether you're early career, late stage, and if you've been, you know, government, academia, private sector, um, and of course, diversity of topics. So we, we don't want to fund, you know, the same problem 20 times. Um, so that's that's one important aspect. The other is is the idea that they want to solve. And so the Heilmeyer is how we're how we're addressing that. What is what is the impact? Um, we've been doing a lot of proactive outreach. Uh, so we launched at Howard University, again, to try to get those communities involved, but, but we know that we need to do better. And um, it's, it's one thing that I, don't, I, I didn't expect when I came to ARPA-H, um, having come from DARPA, everybody in the defense world just, you say DARPA and people know what you're talking about. They know the internet, they know DPS, <laughs> they know mRNA vaccines. And so you don't have to have that conversation explaining it. And what I've, what I've learned is that nobody knows what ARPA-H is. And so really, really need to get out there so that when somebody hears the word program manager, it actually means something to them and it's an exciting opportunity. And so it's really on us to, to, to lean into that and, and our team to, to do a better job um, making folks aware of it and, and bringing all communities forward. Yes. Hi, I'm Wesley. I'm a first year master's student here at Stanford. Can you give us an idea of the amount of influence ARPA-H will have on a certain project? Like if you see an opportunity to increase more collaboration between projects into health science futures, and what are the factors that would change the influence in order to kind of align the interests of the inventor and industry investors, even policymakers, while ensuring you're advancing your vision of maximizing health outcomes? Yeah, so this is these are exactly the questions we ask the program managers when they when they come in and they they want to launch a program. So in that three to four months that they have to develop that concept, they have to really be defining um, what is the impact for who and when, um, but then also making sure that they understand who all those stakeholders are. And so uh, I'll give a real real world example when I launched um, any one of my programs at DARPA, I, I talked to probably about a hundred experts in the field, and so it was. 
uh, you know, if I make this investment, where will this put you and how will this accelerate? And you want to hear that from everybody so that you start to, you start to hear, you know, common threads of like, okay, actually it looks like I have a four or five year horizon. This is the impact. But then who are the stakeholders? Um, for a lot of med tech, it's, it's going to be, you know, CMS and FDA and having them at the table really early on is going to be important for us so that they know some of these technologies are, are coming on the back end. And so I don't have a perfect one size fits all answer for you. It really is on the program manager to to define that for the problem that they're trying to solve. Last question for the live stream. What makes you most optimistic about ARPA-H's potential in advancing novel healthcare solutions, especially for therapeutics? So, so I'll say one thing that makes me most optimistic and then I'll talk about therapeutics. Um, I was really anxious coming into ARPA-H, having left DARPA, and I didn't know if the magic of DARPA, if you ever met DARPA, it's a magic place, and if the magic was the program managers or if it was the mission of the organization. And um, I, coming into a, in st a startup where there was already you know, some staff there, um, was I gonna have to like, introduce this magic? And, and it, I was so pleased when I walked in the door that everybody was excited about it. You know, that from our, our human resources team to our contracting team, they understood the mission. Um, and I asked everybody, why are you here? Like, this is kind of taking a big risk on a startup in government. And they're, you know, my child has a rare disease or I have a parent with dementia that lives at home. And so I'm optimistic because everybody's frustrated and, and wants something better to go beyond the status quo. And so uh, I, I have a team that is just like on fire to make this happen. And so I'm really optimistic about that. Um, specifically for therapeutics, uh, looking forward, there are a lot of platform technologies, I think, that are coming on board that, cr that could kind of create a new regulatory path for, for quicker turn. And, you know, we have, of course, you're all familiar with CRISPR, um, but we don't have the regulatory structures in place yet to, to, like, just do simple updates on, like, a guide sequence. And so can we generate more and more proofs of concept for gene modulators and, and beyond that, that kind of force this, this new era of therapeutics? Um, the fact that, if you just look back at the pandemic, I was at, um, I was at DARPA when the original um, uh, Moderna project was funded. It was four people at the time. Uh, and it, other companies were funded too, but to be able to see that, uh, and then you know, at, during the, the pandemic, the, the entire world took a risk on mRNA uh, technology, and I, w I was like, wow, like we just, we need something fast. We don't really have another option. Um, and so, so, and then now we, we can make you know, billions of doses of, of mRNA. And so that just ushered in the, the, the era of mRNA like so much faster than it, if we hadn't had the, the, the pandemic. And I'm not saying the pandemic was a good thing, but there's a silver lining to that, is that production. And so what, what else can that help catalyze and, and, and accelerate? Your response about your team is a reminder that success always comes down to people with expertise, talents, and passion, doesn't it? I mean, it does, it's yeah. the people that make everything happen. Yeah. So that's great. We'll go back, to, we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions from the room, and uh, yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, Professor Randy Stafford. Um, my question has to do generally with how to navigate the realities of our healthcare system to truly generate that return on investment in the area of technology. And it seems to me that many of the problems you mentioned about our healthcare system, and one could go on a long time, really have yeah. nothing to do with technology. That's right. They have more to do with the fragmentation and disorganization of a system with multiple payers. They have to do with the fact that, in your terminology, we get things to the shelf and then never use it. Yeah. And uh, finally, that many of the incentives in our whole healthcare system are misaligned Mm -hmm. with actually making patients better and having good patient outcomes. Yeah. So in that sort of reality, yeah. how do you situate uh, ARPA-H to really have an expected return on investment? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard challenge. And in, in some ways, I, I hope ARPA-H can you know, create alternative realities <laughs> and show some proofs of concept. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, keeps coming up if people say, how do you fix the electronic um, health records problem? Um, how do you, you know, I'm, my pediatrician's office, uh, my daughter, my daughter was at a doctor recently, my pediatrician's office could not share their records like easily with children's hospitals. Like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> I don't understand why you can't do this. And so, you know, there's, there's thinkers out there from other sectors that have some of these problems solved. And I'll just go back to like my uh, a, a military example at DARPA, you know, uh, 
having observed that like Army, Navy, Air Force uh, information systems, classified systems can talk to one another so that there's not a millisecond lost in offensive targeting. Like they can make that work. Why can't my pediatrician's office <laughs> set a record? So it's like people have solved this. Um, and so I do think bringing in some solutions from other sectors is, is we, should, we should embrace those people and not be afraid that the resume doesn't say anything about healthcare. And, and solve that. So, so what are the realities in other sectors that we can make a reality in the health sector? Well, Renee, thank you very thank much. You. I would say on behalf of all of us in the country, we're so fortunate that you are the inaugural director of ARPA-H. An amazing opportunity uh, and you're the perfect person to lead the agency. So thank you for sharing you your uh, <laughs> vision with us today. And we hope we'll stay in contact and that there'll be lots of interactions uh, between Stanford folks and ARPA-H folks and others in the Bay Area. Thank you for listening to The Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Renee Wegerson, inaugural director of ARPA-H, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. Please send your questions by email to theminorconsult at theminorconsult.com and check out our website, theminorconsult.com, for updates, episodes, and more. To get the latest episodes of The Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. Your feedback helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind.